Circuit Check, CCI, is a Minneapolis, Minnesota-based company that has delivered text fixtures and test systems to medical companies since 1979. Greg came to Circuit Check three years ago. Previously, he spent 25 years at a leading test and measurement company. His current role includes overseeing CCI test solutions that address the medical device industry. Chris Kelly is an applications engineer, expert, scientist with Keysight Technologies in Loveland, Colorado. It now gives me great pleasure to turn things over to our presenters. Thank you. This is the agenda we will use today. And Chris and I will reference back to this as we change topics to uh, not confuse everyone. Let's talk a little bit about the medical electronic situations of today and how wireless medical devices are being used. Why is wireless capability for medical devices important? If you look at this slide I presented at a trade show in 2009, you'll find that the general trends have not changed. Medical costs continue to go up. Wearable wireless devices have the potential to reduce hospitalization, reduce clinical visits, and make, really make our life much, much easier while saving costs. Wearable wireless devices also can provide logging of medical measurements and immediate notification to providers of health conditions that used to require inpatient care. The per capita spending, this is the forecast uh, between 2008 and 16, and I just read that the per capita spending as of June of 2016 was $15,500, substantially higher than the forecast here in 2009. Wireless devices have continued to see a tremendous amount of growth around the world in commercial non-medical applications. Today, GPS, accelerometers, gyroscopes, optical barometric sense, biometric sensors, galvanic skin response sensors, and much, much more uh, are integrated into wearable devices of all kinds. While key market players have seen their respective market shares increase and decrease, the macro level growth remains strong. IDC reports over 100 million commercial grade units sold in 2016. That's up 25%. Frost and Sullivan indicates the market for clinical grade medical devices, those used for, uh, that are used to indicate chronic disease monitoring and other clinical applications are forecasted to reach $19 billion by 2020. That's a compounded annual growth rate of 30%. You know, these numbers are noted on this by the Frost and Sullivan report that is on the assumption that the wireless device approval process will become much more efficient. Many of the consumer wearables on the market today are not ready for medical use, but the technology they are built upon is ready for medical validation. Consumer wearables, those companies know how to make devices that people want to wear regularly, but most lack the infrastructure, processes, and experience required for medical grade accuracy, clinical validation, and regulatory approvals. Here's a, a chart uh, along different categories of wearable health personal devices and the regulated, how regulated they are down at the, um, at the bottom. And you can see anything related to disease diagnostics, therapeutics, uh, those it's very, very important that the product is validated to medical standards. The research, testing, and validation leading up to the FDA approval are the largest time and resource commitments. Now, this is further complicated by the fact that some medical device companies and most consumer wearable device manufacturers don't have the adequate in-house capabilities to perform the most important component, use case validation. This is where RF coexistence testing comes into play. Coexistence testing is a requirement and a component of use case validation. With video cameras, home alarms, thermostat, refrigerator, smart locks, toasters, causing a lot of congestion in the air, uh, it's obviously important that medical devices you have connected to you perform adequately.
The FDA has not been on the sidelines, but have been addressing the issue for several years. Uh, the first guidance document was published in 2007 with a revised version released in 2013. This overall document outlines the importance of correct, timely, and secure transmission of medical data and information and documents specific areas designers should focus upon during their design process. The key points of the document are that the designers and manufacturers of wireless medical devices should consider their ability of their devices to function properly in the intended use environments where the other RF wireless technologies will likely be located. More specifically, as the highlighted section shows, C63.27 clearly states that the designer addressed the risk through testing for RF coexistence. The problem with the current version of the document is that it, is that it does not give you much help on how to test for RF coexistence. On May 3rd, 2011, a subcommittee was commissioned to study the need for wireless coexistence evaluation methods in response to an FDA request. All of that work was finally released on May 11, 2017. In parallel to uh, the ANSI C6327 document, a complementary document called the TIR69 was published in February. C63.27 provides an evaluation process and supporting test methods to quantify the ability of a wireless device to coexist with other wireless devices and other wireless services in its, in its intended radio frequency environments. AAMI's TIR69 provides a, provides a process and guidance on performing the radio frequency wireless coexistence evaluation as part of an overall medical device risk management approach, the documentation perspective. Major contributors uh, to all of this effort for uh, the ANSI C63 are on the, on the slide here. Definitely compliment Steven Berger, Jason Coder, and Nick Lasorda, as well as the University of Oklahoma in, in Tulsa. Okay, thank you, Greg. That's a good uh, overview of how we've come to where we are today. and. Uh, so the first question that may come to mind is this word RF coexistence. This is uh, a new term for most of us, and uh, it, it has very specific meanings. Uh, first of all, it is not EMI or EMC testing. In EMC, uh, well, EMI uh, tests whether the device is emitting unintended RF signals. This may be out of power supplies, uh, clocks, uh, display driving lines, uh, things like this. Don't uh, emit something that you're not intending to. In fact, your device may not even be a wireless device. EMI tests to make sure you're not creating interference. EMC, electromagnetic compatibility, then tests the susceptibility of a device to some signal other than the intended frequency. So your device may be operating at 900 megahertz or, or 2.4 gigahertz. And this test to see whether your device has upset due to strong signals on some other frequency. It doesn't specifically look at the communications frequency of a wireless device. Now, coexistence testing, on the other hand, evaluates the ability of the device to maintain its functional wireless performance. Now, that's a, that's a key phrase right there, FWP. What is the device intending to do? Um, I'll, I'll get in a little bit more into how you decide what you're going to test, but that's the entire set of things that the device might want to do with its wireless transceiver. Uh, it tests both the intended and unintended signals for what impact they'll have on the device. So when the device is speaking, uh, transmitting on the air, um, is it working properly? Uh, is the throughput all right? Well, what happens if some signal in the same vicinity either on the same frequency, in the same band, on the same channel, or even adjacent channels, if some other device comes up, what impact does that have on the functional performance of that device? Again, it tests both co-channel and other nearby frequencies. And one of the concerns here is that we're dealing with the ISM bands in many cases, um, although this uh, 
the C63 document can be used in anything, including medical, non-medical in the ISM bands, the industrial scientific and medical bands. It can also be used in any other situation. You can imagine um, uh, a ship which has many different RF devices uh, close in. Uh, this gives you a general concept of how to test coexistence between various devices. Different modulation formats on, on 2.4 gigahertz, such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee. And when I say Wi-Fi, of course, there's four or five different standards that are operating on the air. And then how do we go about testing that wireless performance? Little diagram at the bottom is one of the possible ways that you might configure a test system. So let's have a look at a couple of different uh, ways. If you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question. If you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question. If you look at the long logical versus physical um, uh, question, if you look at the long time OSI network model, at the very bottom we have the physical layer. This is the actual medium that we're using for communications, whether that was a wire or in this case we're using radio frequencies. And then above the physical layer you have error detection and then addressing and then end-to-end -end connections. And finally at the highest layer you have the the human interface. Well, the physical domain is that whole layer from roughly uh, physical up about to or through the data link layer. And in interference analysis, we're starting at the physical layer, which is what most test instrumentation can cover pretty well, but we're beginning to go higher up there. What is the frequency? Uh, what is the modulation type and so on in the physical layer? And then above that, you have device behaviors that are getting a little more intelligent. Uh, how do we handle uh, error correction and things like that at the, at the higher levels? They may happening, that may be happening at multiple layers in your device. Now, dividing the, the uh, coexistence factors, you can kind of distill this large and complex problem into three key areas. Uh, and that is, number one, the frequency. Uh, the probability of coexistence uh, increases as you separate the two devices in frequency. If you have somebody on the same channel, you'll have problems. If you'll have, or you have a p higher potential. If you have adjacent channels, you have a lower potential. If you have somebody on a completely different band, certainly there will be a, a lower likelihood of interference and a higher likelihood of coexistence. A second consideration is space. If you increase the distance between devices trying to use the same frequency band or frequency range, uh, the probability of coexistence will increase. This gets you around problems like the hidden node problem or um, the hidden transmitter problem where you can't hear competing devices and you don't know when the channel is free in time, uh, you know, and you're able to communicate. Or you can't hear the intended device to which you're connected. And finally, time. Well, all of these digital communications are, are tend to be bursty in nature. And if you um, have a higher channel occupancy, it's more likely you're going to have collisions. It's more likely you're going to have retries. And so the probability of coexistence will increase as that channel gets less busy. So coexistence is possible if you solve one of those three issues. 
First of all, give your device adequate frequency separation. That's going to depend on the environment you're intending to use the device, of course. Second, a sufficient physical distance between the wireless networks. And finally, how busy is that channel overall? Uh, if you were to go into a hospital these days with a spectrum analyzer, you'd find um, hundreds of devices. Even a small local hospital I visited a while back had over 930 devices on the air connected to their Wi-Fi network. That did not count other devices such as Bluetooth and, and, and cell phones that were strolling through the hospital at the time. So let's dig into this frequency question a little bit more. We have here on the slide uh, three different formats, 802.11, 802.15, and, and Bluetooth, that are all trying to use the same band, the 2.4 megahertz or 2.4 gigahertz uh, industrial, scientific, and medical band. This is a band that's pretty much free for use. Although the FCC has some overall guidance on how a device should behave, uh, it's up to these uh, individual uh, uh, standards, uh, 802.11, whatever, uh, for example, to to decide exactly what the on the air behavior is. And you end up with a, a bunch of different behaviors. You can have Bluetooth doing frequency hopping. You can have Wi-Fi doing direct sequence spread spectrum over 20 or 40 megahertz of spectrum. Uh, and these uh, these devices are going to actively try to optimize their own communications. So while Bluetooth may back off of some frequencies it finds uh, low results on, it, it evaluates its 79 channels. Some channels it just finds a lot of errors on. Uh, it may drop those channels and go to others. If a high packet error rate um, is discovered on that channel, it's identified as busy because it may not even be able to sense that low amplitude, very broadband 802.11 uh, signal. So the second, second possible solution is the physical relationship between the devices. Here we see in, in purple the Wi-Fi client device. It's attempting to talk to, let's say, Wi-Fi access point two. Well, Wi-Fi access point three is just down the hall, uh, possibly on the same or possibly on a different channel. Uh, if, if they can hear each other, there's a pretty good chance that those protocols, those 802.11 Wi-Fi protocols, are going to be able to detect and avoid each other. But then you have a couple of Zigbee devices, which one of which is in range of that Wi-Fi client and its access point. It's going to try to communicate with its paired device there, and it may not even be able to see the Wi-Fi signal. And certainly if the client is talking to AP3, it may not be able to see what a Zigbee device too, and so forth. And finally, to complicate all this, you have this Wi-Fi hotspot come strolling into the room, and uh, you, you have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi uh, playing at the same time on the same channels. Uh, some people call that a rogue network, and it's pretty hard to, uh, to do without because you just have visitors coming into the medical facility, for example. So physically separating these devices may be uh, a solution, and part of the testing may have an outcome that says, please keep this medical wireless device separated by so many feet from any other wireless device using um, this uh, ISM band. That may be an outcome from your testing. The final problem, uh, problem three, is a little more difficult to solve. Um, there are multiple solutions for this, but basically a Wi-Fi signal, like an 802.11b, has abundant white space. It doesn't spend all of its time on the air. Uh, there's probably only, you know, 25 to 50 percent, if that spectrum occupancy, by just a Wi-Fi device. However, then a Bluetooth device, which doesn't recognize the presence of Wi-Fi, begins to transmit. The Wi-Fi device, not recognizing Bluetooth, then transmits on top of it, and you get that red box where the collision between Bluetooth and Wi-Fi probably causes both of those to fail. Uh, further on down the timeline, we see Bluetooth talking, Zigbee talking, then Zigbee begins a transmission, and Wi-Fi, not recognizing its presence, transmits on top of it. Both of those are going to fail. Now, what's going to happen in a situation like this? The collision will cause errors in the communications. Both of those standards will try to recover, 
when they retransmit or reconnect or whatever their behavior is, they may collide on those things as well. So the more white space you have, the higher probability that any given transmission is going to work. And uh, as crowding increases, you get less white space. And finally, your channel occupancy goes way beyond the, the nominal to accomplish communications because it's spending so much time trying to recover from the errors. So there's the, the problem of, of what is coexistence. Now let's talk a little bit more specifically about how do you test for coexistence. We've painted a rather complex picture with multiple standards uh, occupying the same space and possibly the same frequency. Well, uh, ANSI C6327 uh, defines a process. It's, it's a very clear and complete document, although there are things coming in the future. A uh, very complete document, but it's up to the test developer to decide why he is testing, what he needs to test, and is probably going to ask for some assistance in, in defining that test. So Clause 5, sort of a Chapter 5, is test plan development. It talks about how do you identify what the environment is you're going into? What does that RF environment look like? How do I pick what the interfering signals are I'm going to test? How do I decide what it is about my device that is vulnerable? The functional wireless performance, that term I referred to earlier, is sort of the collection of all the things that that device can do wirelessly. I need to evaluate that device and say, which ones of those are critical? And what do I consider a failure? If I have a device that merely has to report my battery is getting low, it might not matter if that can be accomplished in 10 seconds or five minutes. And so if that message can get through, first of all, that's a relatively low risk uh, item. And secondly, it's a fairly low priority. That might not be the part of functional wireless performance that I decide to test for. However, if I have an insulin pump that needs to have a new table of operation loaded to it, that might be something a little more important. Or if I have a device that's doing monitoring of a patient and it needs to send an alarm, that might be quite a high risk thing to say, I need to get this communication accomplished. If it gets interfered with, delayed, or corrupted, that becomes a very high risk. So this test plan development encompasses all of those uh, considerations in how am I going to design my test. Then Clause 6 talks about testing, uh, and then Clause 7. Uh, any of you working with the FDA know how important the results reports are, uh, analysis and summary of those reports, and this Clause 7 provides guidance for the most popular test objectives. So you will have an idea, examples of how to perform these tests. Now, C63 is aimed certainly at, at the wireless and it for, or at the medical, but it form, and it forms a foundation for all types of coexistence testing. TIR69 then talks tuning that a little more for the, the medical environment in particular. So C63 absolutely is the foundation. TIR69 is a lot more assistance in deciding how to do this for a medical situation. What are my test methods? Well, there's four overall methods. The first one is conducted. It's, it, it happens entirely within the wires, the coaxial cables, and it connects both the, uh, on the, on the left-hand side of the diagram, you see the EUT, the equipment under test. It con connects the equipment under test to its companion device shown on the right. This would be, for example, a Wi-Fi device and its access point, its AP. And, you're going to have signals flowing between those. You'll have splitters to allow signals to be mixed in for monitoring devices to watch that communication as it goes on. The EUT and the companion device are turned on. Uh, communication is established, and this is after you've already decided what your interfering signals are and what your uh, key performance indicators are, whether that's time delay or packet error rate. What is it that I, that I really want to measure? Those are turned on and tested, and then the unintended signals are introduced and uh, measurements are made on the performance, those key performance indicators, uh, while the interference is ramped to the point of uh, actually causing a behavior that is not wanted. This is a, a fairly straightforward test method. 
it keeps everything within the wires, and therefore it's very measurable and very reproducible. Unfortunately, it does not show what the behavior of the antennas are, uh, what the actual on-the-air signal does. This is important when you have, uh, for example, MIMO, uh, multiple antenna, multiple signal paths going between your device and its access point. So it's a very repeatable, measurable uh, test, but it isn't necessarily the most realistic. In this and all the tests, you see the purple box, the spectrum monitor. You have to monitor the test uh, at each step of the way and document what the intended and unintended signal behaviors were. Now, the second form of test is a two-chamber method in which we have a pair of chambers that are connected uh, through antennas. Um, and then you have attenuators between these chambers. Again, we have a spectrum monitor. And through the antennas, uh, an interference source is introduced. This can uh, measure some of the, um, some of the on the air effects. A, a medical device may be so compact that its antenna port is not even accessible to coax. This will take into account some account the actual behavior of the antenna, its placement on the device, the amount of power driving to it, its, its beam pattern, other things about the device. So this is the second of four different major methods of testing coexistence. Uh, the third method is in a large uh, radiated anechoic chamber. So you can have a single large chamber and you have some spacing between the uh, unit under test and its companion equipment. Then you have the, these unintended signals, uh, transmit, receive, or simulated. And uh, in this case, more antenna effects are accounted for. It can handle either through line of sight or non-line of sight, uh, non-line of sight in a, in a uh, not completely anechoic chamber. It can test the behavior of your MIMO, for example, if you have certain reflective surfaces and absorptive surfaces uh, set up in, inside your testing chamber. And then the, the fourth coexistence test method is just in the open lab. This may be um, most realistic in some ways, but probably the least reproducible because you are in the open air. There may be other things going on on the channels that you're not controlling, those other, those other things. Uh, but this is, a, this is another way to, to do the testing. All four of these methods are uh, discussed in the reports. Throughout all four of those, you notice that we had spectrum monitoring. In all test methods, uh, what those signals are actually doing needs to be recorded and documented and, and placed into the reports. Now, they also give in these reports uh, some band-specific guidance. It's not a complete exhaustive list, but it has a nice list of the most common cases that you can use as an example. Let me introduce here the, the second dimension of test. We talked about four different test methods, chamber and open air, so forth. Um, at this point, we begin to enter the concept of risk. Uh, in C6327, these are called tiers. The, the lowest uh, severity test is tier three. And in this left-hand side, we see we're testing Bluetooth against, um, uh, against the Wi-Fi signal. So we have a single 802.11n signal, uh, and because 802.11n has multiple on-the-air formats, you can specify which of those you're going to test against. So you're competing a single signal against a single signal. In the next level of risk, you have a pair of tests going on. Two 802.11n signals are tested against the Bluetooth, and in the second test, two adjacent band LTE signals. Uh, LTE cell phone signals are, are in the same vicinity, uh, frequency-wise. And finally, the most severe test, uh, Tier 1. In this case, we have three 802.11n signals as the first test, and in the second, you have two LTE signals being used. This is an example of the kind of recommendations that you're going to see in the report. On the right, you can see an, another example for Wi-Fi at 2.4 gigahertz. Uh, what, what are you testing against? Uh, looking at these uh, evaluation tiers, 
well, what am I going to do to make these measurements? At the lowest risk, I'm just testing a single IEEE 802.11n transmission. Uh, how do I do that? Well, an example of how you do that in, in a wired test, for example, uh, you'd use some kind of a vector signal generator to be able to use those uh, or to generate those simulated on-the-air signals uh, to feed into your transmission uh, or into your uh, yeah, transmission line or into your um, uh, test chamber antennas. In the second one, uh, you you might use uh, a signal generator and that and that uh, um, card-based or or box-based uh, uh, vector signal generators, and then you'll need some kind of a library uh, to generate these test signals for you, uh, some kind of software to help you generate a realistic uh, uh, test pattern, and then at the highest risk, you're going to have multiple of these things going on. Uh, you may have multiple generators simultaneously going on. You might actually be using actual um, devices that would be representative of your um, routers in your hospital, for example. And finally, a spectrum monitor. Uh, this is to document what exactly was it that I tested, and uh, that allows others to reproduce the test to, to give your measurement uncertainty uh, a, a boost. Uh, another example, I'll just use this very quickly, um, the same kind of concept. In this case, we're using a 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi and testing against, uh, you know, other signals. Now, what am I going to, what am I going to think about when I look at uh, test equipment to perform these kind of tests? Uh, certainly, we need a signal generator. I'm going to want to be able to encompass the frequency range of the signals that I'm uh, testing. Uh, and I want those signals to be relatively pure. I don't want uh, any kind of uh, spurious or inaccurate amplitude or any of those kinds of things to interfere with the quality of my test. So my purity of signals is going to be really, really important. And I list a, a few pieces of equipment there as signal generators, depending on what frequencies you're testing, what bandwidth you're going to need. Uh, some of these new Wi-Fi's are going up to very high bandwidth. Uh, so if you're going to be testing realistic waveforms, you're going to need generators that can do those very high bandwidth uh, waveforms. Uh, simulation uh, of signals, you're going to need some kind of software to generate those. Many of those may be already in existence in libraries. Many can be generated uh, by a software package uh, uh, or, as I say, it's either a library or a software package. You can even generate custom waveforms in these software packages. And then at the most severe end, and we didn't talk about this a great deal, you may need interactive signaling to act as if you had live interference going on. If you don't actually use a router and, um, and a wireless device as your unintended signal, you may need intelligent instruments to generate simulated communications in a very controlled way. And uh, some of these, uh, such as the UXM wireless test set, can do that. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Greg, and he'll discuss the repeatability during medical device testing. Thanks, Chris. So a lot of information in a short period of time. We have one more section we wanted to discuss with you to, to share how we may be able to bring all of that technical information together to you as test engineers in design, design verification tests, and production. You know. Everything that you've learned up to this point is key for the FDA is being able to have test repeatability. And as outlined in the CFR 820.30, every medical device company will have a design history file that documents everything that you do during the design process to ensure repeatability. As part of that design history file, you'll have a device master record. And each time the master record is updated due to a product revision, it's placed in the design history file. This is where, of course, you'll place everything that you're doing with regards to RF coexistence and all of the test methods um, that you've used in verifying your device and validating your device to intended use. You know, the design history file is going to document all of those tools and all those methods. So what I wanted to share with you is just some uh, pictures of 
interfacing and technologies that may be of value to you in the design design verification onto production. There are some basic characteristics for setup in DVT and production that helps ensures repeatability. You know, some of them are very uh, simple. For example, you definitely want to ensure that all of the instrumentation that you have is NIST traceable. It sounds simple enough, but there's many smaller organizations that uh, we at Circuit Check go to, and they'll take a part of the design and attempt to use that as a component in a test system itself. Where things start to go sideways is when the quality person or the or the group itself asks about repeatability. Uh, not to, not to mention, what if that employee leaves the company? That person that designed that test instrument just went out the door with the the technology. Secondly, a large part of time in the test and measurement software validation building process in R and D is spent around documenting how the design requirements have been covered and being able to repeat the setup. For many, this requires creation of a traceability matrix, fiddle paper, which pairs the test requirement with the location of the test code where the requirement was covered. As most of all of you listening to this seminar know, you know, modifications to requirements are almost inevitable, uh, most often as a result of unforeseen changes and, as we know, feature creep. For this reason, it's really recommended, especially with this RF coexistence, to leverage an integrated requirements management, requirements management and configuration management tool tailored specifically to test software. This can help provide insight to what tests were actually impacted by code changes. There are several tools on the market that support many of the test and measurement software development environments. You'll find them for C language, Python, and others. The value delivered by these integrated requirements management tools to test software developers is that it allows you to map the individual unit tests, the test results, and the code implementation all the way to the requirement automatically. From an interfacing perspective, you know, when you're in design and design verification, you're going to have a multitude of unit tests that are required to satisfy the FDA guidance materials that states that the system should be challenged with a normal inputs and conditions, that is, the endpoints. So how do you achieve repeatability? You know, it's it's always good to have a repeatable test setup for the gut to measurement instrumentation. If not, it's very difficult to show in your design history file the repeatability of RF coexistence measurements. With other types of measurements, you typically can create a record, but with RF, it's, it's much more difficult. This is a simple picture, and this will have a fixture that was a customer in R&D of one or more, uh, allow them to use one or more DUTS product variants with a simple fixture. So the top screws that you see here help hold down the DUT in place for repeatability on the desktop because this is a fixture that's sitting on R&D desktop. In this case, the PCBA was attached to the fixture would be typically in a conducted or wired RF coexistence test environment on the benchtop. So probes may contact the underside of the PCBA using a wireless test fixture plate then standard off-the-shelf cables connect to the back bottom side of that fixture over to a spectrum analyzer, an oscilloscope, DMM, and so on. What's mentioning in this picture is a view of the connector from the bottom side. And the, in this example, the RF cables were conducted were attached directly to the top side of the PCB. So the, the key point I wanted to show is that the knobs on the left and the right allow one to replace the probe plates for different variants. Well, the top and bottom sliders use to hold, duck, hold the duct down and ensure repeatability. Very simple setup. It's easy to reproduce and it's easy to document within your RD and your validation plans. Also, from a risk-based approach, how do you go to a con open over the air? And this is an example of an RF-based design verification fixture. So instead of being conducted, uh, we're over the air. And what you see is the metal top plate has been removed from the desktop fixture. That allows the test engineer easy access to all of the configuration for the test setup. And then during normal operation, a test engineer will use that front drawer. And you notice there's two nests there uh, to do repeating repetitive measurements on multiple duts and test over 
time. So the last topic we wanted to share today really kind of covers the characteristics of production tests. So now then, I have this RF coexistence test and design, design verification. You know, there will be pieces of it from a risk-based approach. I'm not going to take all of your RF coexistence testing to the production in use case. Typically, what you'll do is you'll, you'll select interferers that may be dependent on the product and specifically the antenna assembly process. You know, the repeatability of these RF coexistence testing methods in production is really dependent upon the architecture and the life cycle management of the production test system itself. And here's, there's a few recommendations that we would make with regards to production tests to help you with your QMS and CAMP standards. Starting with the obvious, you know, test rack wiring should be separated from the high and low power signals as well as RF from each other as much as possible. It should be noted that uh, many test system racks are, they're not designed for production. They are tailored towards server racks. And what I, and this picture shows here is an example of a rack architected specifically for medical applications and production tests. It's a 24 inch wide with auxiliary panels on the sides to accommodate signal conditioning, air control, and other needs. Both these panels are removable, so it allows you access to extra space within the rack. The value here is it allows the PXI instrumentation or your traditional instrumentation to nicely fit in the core while the auxiliary conditioning is nicely mounted on the outside panels. For protection, you'll see a thick anodized top plate that helps with ESD and allows for weight of heavy fixtures, which may include pneumatics. Another characteristic to be aware of in production with regards to RF coexistence is that of custom cables. I know custom cables are a necessity, but they are an enemy in, when it comes to life cycle management. The challenge can be magnified for custom one-off cables for sure. In this picture, we're showing an example of an ATE rack where the core architecture of the system is built around PXI modular instrumentation. What, what you see here in this example of a tabletop ATE that minimizes cabling, the upper right and the lower right, the chassis is actually mounted to the top plate of the AT base. That allows the traditional instrumentation to fit in the base cavity, while all of the modular high performance switching is directly integrated to the mass interconnect. So if we kind of dive into this mass interconnect piece, because the whole goal in production is to minimize cable, keep cables as short as possible, especially with regards to RIF. So looking at the top left picture, the most common method of interchangeable interconnect to a fixture or a small ITA that you see here is the use of cabled wires from the PXI instruments to the receiver. You know, challenges of this are life cycle management, upgrade cost, build cost, and overall support. I mean, try to imagine you have five or six PXI switches, each with 100 plus signals cabled out to a receiver. Trying to debug one of those can just eat up hours of labor cost. On the lower right is a method that uses an off-the-shelf interposer boards made of PCB materials that directly connect the PXI module instrumentation to the receiver. So what this helps is this helps ensure connect, uh, conductivity, repeatability, and helps eliminate RF interference. These are off-the-shelf modules or they could be easily custom made. Mac panel probably found the this concept the mass interconnect and offers the most complete offering. Uh, but there are other suppliers out there that uh, produce this type of interconnect. At Circuit Check we found this very helpful in reducing our build cost times too. So kind of the final slide I wanted to show is with regards to production tests that includes automation. Many times the, the concept of the cost of test and that of validating the tester are separated. You know, it's typically the test system supplier or the internal test group that will be verifying the production tester to define test requirement specification. They will then hand the tester over to the quality of the factory engineers who will be validating the production tester for its intended purpose through IQ, OQ, and PQ. One of the most difficult tasks is to validate a production tester where you have many manual processes. For example, 
an operator being required to hand install small connectors onto a PCBA before functional test, or operators being required to touch the gut multiple times throughout the production process. The tester on the left is an example that combines PCBA level test with integrated through connector testing. The operator simply loads the dust, and all the connections via probes and to the connectors are made via pneumatics. And the other fixture you see on top of this base rat is performing all of the RF measurements. So the operator is only loading, unloading, loading, unloading for a complete product test. Now, such an architecture really reduces this risk-based approach to test validation to help ensure repeatability. And the, the key point that I'd like to make to those of you in the audience that are production test engineers, be sure to go and look at the cost of validating the test system to your overall production cost, because that clearly can help justify the ROI to reduce and improve your quality, reduce risk and improve quality. The two pictures on the right are an example of interchangeable fixtures on top of the same APE. The lower picture shows the test system where the modular nest, so that's a subassembly product. You have a modular nest for product variants, so you have interchangeability. The top picture is simply just a removing of the fixture, a replacement of the fixture in the base ATE, and now you're being able to perform vision inspection display tests. From a GAMP perspective, the base AT is about the same for both systems. This type of architecture really helps reduce that overall validation time of the tester variants when they are placed into service. Uh, what we'd like to do next is uh, Chris and I will uh, pass it back over to our moderator and we'll answer some questions.